Let's go ahead. Good morning. Today is July 18, 2024. It's approximately 9.30 a.m. This is the matter of file Z0339-23-E. This is an application for expansion or an alteration of an existing non-conforming use. Uh, the application is to allow the conducting of drifting events in full-size cars, automobiles, on the existing track at Pat's Acres Racing Complex. The uh, application does not involve uh, f new physical alterations to the existing site improvements. There's no proposal for that. My name is Carl Cox. I'm a private attorney. I am appointed land use hearings officer for Clackamas County with authority to conduct this hearing and make a determination in this matter. I will state several important things for the record. Uh, first, I've not received any ex parte contact. No one contacted me outside of these proceedings to try to persuade me concerning a fact or issue present at this hearing. I did have an opportunity to review uh, all of the exhibits and uh, uh, documents that were submitted to the public, uh, to the to the land use planning file in advance of this hearing, including an updated exhibit, I think that was submitted yesterday or the evening before, uh, Exhibit 18 and subsequent uh, exhibits uh, 19 and 20. Um, I have considered issues of bias and conflict of interest and have determined that I do not have any bias or conflict of interest in this matter. The county is making a record of this hearing. That record is available through the county. Uh, prior to ending or closing the record in this matter, I will, uh, I will discuss an opportunity to keep or request that the record is kept open for an additional period. We'll talk about that more later. This is a quasi-judicial land use hearing, which means two important things for those participating in this hearing. First, all of the criteria that can be used in reaching a decision have been identified in the staff report. Testimony, arguments, and evidence must be directed towards the criteria identified in the staff report or other relevant criteria found in the comprehensive plan or other land use regulation that the person believes applies to the decision accordingly. Please direct your testimony to a relevant approval criterion. Second, failure to raise an issue accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the decision maker and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issue may preclude appeal to the Oregon Land Use Board of Appeals on that issue. Failure of the applicant to raise constitutional or other issues relating to proposed conditions of approval with sufficient specificity to allow the local government or its designee to respond to the issue precludes an action for damages in circuit court. Once final, this decision may be appealed to the Oregon Land Use Board of Appeals. At this time, I'm asking that the county provide an explanation concerning participation in this hearing via the Zoom platform. Okay. This public hearing is being conducted virtually using the Zoom platform. Panelists for today's hearing, which include the hearings officer, county staff, and the applicant have both audio and video capability. Audience members who have joined the meeting will have their mics muted unless they wish to testify, in which case they will be called upon to do so by the county staff moderator. Audience members' video will not be turned on at any time. Today's hearing is being recorded as required by law. The county will make every effort to post the recording on the county website later today. There is a designated time during the hearing when it will be open for testimony. The hearings officer will make it clear when this is. If you want to provide testimony, you will utilize the raise hand feature. Attendees on a PC and iPad, you have a raise hand button on the Zoom bar, top or bottom depending on of your device depending on depending on your device. When the moderator switches you over to provide testimony, your screen will look different for a little while. Primarily, you will see all participants' cameras and not just the one who is speaking. Staff will call upon you when it is time for you to provide testimony. Be sure to provide your name and mailing address when you begin. Once you have provided your testimony, your mic will be muted and your screen will return to normal. If the record is left open at the end of the hearing and you wish to submit additional written testimony, email written testimony to myself, Lindsay Nesbitt, 
um, which is lnesbitt at clackamas.us. When I start my presentation, my email address will also be on the first slide as well as the last slide if you'd like to write it down. Or, and then my um, presentation will also have our address as well. Or email your testimony to Clackamas County Planning and Zoning, 150 Beaver Creek Road, Oregon City, 97045. The staff contact email is also available on the webpage where you found the Zoom link for today's meeting. Tem testimony must be received by 4 p.m. on the day the record closes. People who testify and provide their mailing address will receive a copy of the hearings officer's written decision. If you do not wish to testify but would like to receive the decision, you must provide your email and standard mailing address. By emailing to the staff contact, for the application or by entering it in the Zoom chat function during the hearing. Thank you. Uh, the order of proceedings that, well, first, this uh, is an appeal of a denial by the county. The hearing is de novo, so I will make a decision based on the facts as uh, presented through this hearing process, including the uh, exhibits and documentation that I've already received and reviewed and the testimony submitted or provided today and also uh, potentially subsequent to this hearing if the record uh, stays open post this hearing. My preference is that I have the county begin the hearing by presenting what I believe is the county staff report, followed by an opportunity for the applicant to present evidence, testimony, and uh, advocacy that the applicant wants me to consider. Then I may uh, allow a rebuttal period. I will uh, for certain, allow an opportunity for members of the general public. My preference, again, is that uh, uh, following that preference, that uh, general public testimony at that time, uh, we'll discuss rebuttal if uh, necessary. Ms. Nesbitt, thank will you, you again. All right. Okay, I'm sharing my screen. Um, can everybody see my presentation on the screen? Okay. My volume is okay? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So again, my email address is lnesbitt at clackmans.us. And as um, the hearings officer stated, today is an appeal of a staff uh, or planning director denial of a request to alter a non-conforming use. Uh, So the applicant's original re request was for staff to verify that automobile drifting is an allowed use authorized under prior non-conforming use alter alterations for um, the Pat's Acre Racing Complex. It's located just outside of Canby. It's a racing complex that was originally approved for go-karts and motorcycles and some other, um, uh, other amenities such as RC uh, racing and paintball activities. But if uh, staff was unable to verify that automobile drifting was allowed under the prior NCU uh, alterations, then they requested an alteration to the non-conforming use for the automobile drifting, drifting for this facility. The staff report uh, provides a lot of detail of the prior non-conforming use verifications and subsequent alterations. Um, it talks about what was approved, what couldn't be verified, and what was denied for each of the decisions, um, each of the various decisions over the years. I plan to do a high-level presentation and just briefly go over um, the background, but the staff report provides, uh, fills in all of the details as well. So, um, so the park was developed as a, pri originally developed as a private park, it had a pavilion and a motorcycle racetrack. It was developed prior to zoning. The site was used for town meetings, uh, concerts, dances, and other types of local events. The first zoning was applied to the site in 1967. It was the general use zone. Also in 1967, a conditional use application was approved for this site. I'll talk about that on my next slide. The property was then rezoned to agricultural in 1979. And then in 1993, the exclusive farm use zone, which we also refer to as the EFU zone, was applied to the site and then officially adopted in 1996. 
So when the zoning changed to agricultural and then EFU is when it became non-conforming because racing complexes are definitely not allowed uses in the exclusive farm use zone. So as stated in 1967, the site was formalized with a conditional use permit where they authorized a authorized a half mile wide, a half mile long, 20 foot wide paved go-kart track. They talked about who would be using the track. There was a condition of approval that said all carts must be equipped with quiet mufflers. And then it also authorized renovations of the bathrooms, the dance hall, which we refer to as the pavilion and a caretaker's house. So then in 1999, a non-conforming use uh, verification and alteration was submitted. And this was the first time, or this is when the non-conforming use was officially verified. And as I said, the staff decision provides much more detail about what was verified, what couldn't be verified, and um, what was altered in conditions of approval related to that. But generally, the they verified that, yes, the track was lawfully established, the pavilion was lawfully established, and they are, in fact, non-conforming uses. It approved an expansion of the paved go-kart track, installation of bleacher seating, and a lean-to storage shed allowed for freight vans and tents to be used for seasonal repair. And it limited use of the track six days a week, Tuesday through Sunday, during late daylight hours after 9 a.m. Um, cart racing and rentals for the public were allowed on weekends. It authorized recreational paintball activities, on-site camping for race participants, um, in, uh, placement of a recreational vehicle for, for a caretaker residence. There was a condition of uh, approval or a statement saying no racing events or recreational use of the cart track or subject property by motorcycles, dirt carts, quad carts, quarter midgets, et cetera, were, um, were permitted. And can I just pause you for a moment on that one? Because you started by saying it was a motorcycle racetrack, but did you mean a go-kart racetrack in the beginning? Um, so looking at the history, I, I haven't reviewed the decision since the prior decision since December. Uh, my recollection is it was approved. They, Sorry, I have my staff report open right here. Sorry, yes, it says my staff decision says a half mile. Oh, wait, the conditional use permit. Okay, wait. Um, it says in 1962, approximately in approximately 1962, a dirt motorcycle track was developed at the site. So it was developed as a private park with the pavilion, with the town halls, and then they did a dirt motorcycle track. And in 1967, they requested to turn the the track. I believe they requested to do a paved go-kart track. And then at some point, I know that there was motorcycle use, but then there was a flood and the hearings officer found that that motorcycle use had not been reestablished. Um, okay. But then later, as I'll go through these um, decisions, then they did an alteration to allow motorcycle uses as well. Thanks for explaining. <laughs> okay, so just let me get, okay. Okay, so then, so they had, I just did, okay, yes. Okay, so then in 2006, a alteration was, a non-conforming use alteration was submitted. And in this decision, the staff um, verified that um, the previous non-conforming uses have continued and there have they haven't been discontinued for more than 12 months. Although I think this is the one where it might talk about the motorcycle um, how they didn't prove that, but it's detailed in my staff report. Um, so they verified that there wasn't a discontinuation of any of the uses, and then they approved um, additional alterations. In this, okay, never mind, I take that back, sorry. In 2006 is when they allowed um, motorcycle racing, um, uh, motorcycle racing here. So um, what, what the, sorry, what the, alteration said was allowed use of the paved track for occasional motorcycle race events to incur in place of cart events. There was a condition that it's limited to the existing paved track, but um, then there was also further discussion and condition saying that the motorcycle racing shall be limited to the existing paved track and an extension of the track as shown on the site plan. I have um, slides later to talk about um, that have that site plan and additional 
Yes, and as I just like a little clarification there, is the extension of the track as shown on the site plan also paved? Was that anticipated or not? The, it was not paved. Not paved. Okay, not I just paved. wanted to get some clarity. Yep. So they were saying it's mostly going to be on the paved, but there's this little dirt track, a little extension of the dirt track, which they can also use as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, and then so they just um, in this just in this alteration, they um, allowed portions of the pavilion uh, building to be used for the like a pro shop and have, you know, sales repair and then installation of um, shipping containers for more storage and, and um, stuff associated with the go kart and motorcycle and then construction of a 40 foot by 60 foot shop. And then. In 2007 was the last um, non-conforming use alteration. Uh, we call them verifications and alterations because we're not verifying the, the non-conforming use again. We're just verifying that it's still in compliance with the previous approvals and it hasn't changed. Um, um, so this, this alteration permitted parking of private cart trailers, um, gas-powered RC, the, the racing, um, it, Permitted a placement of one recreational vehicle for our caretaker watchman with 180 day limitation and it permitted placement of large temporary tents for shelters of racers and other patrons during. Um, and then it said all the prior conditions of approval also apply. So this so was supposed to be my brief history of what was approved. Um, it didn't feel so brief, but um, so typically when somebody submits an app, a non-conforming use alteration, our first step is to look at the discontinuation. We look at the previous land use approvals to determine what was allowed because, you know, the non-conforming uses are, they're very specific because um, they're not allowed anymore. So like, and conditions can be placed on these to ensure that um, they don't cause impacts to neighboring parcels and, and to ensure that they don't, you know, turn into different types of uses or whatnot. So what we do is we take a look at what was previously approved and documentation that the applicant submits to demonstrate that they're still in compliance with those previous approvals and that there hasn't been a discontinuation of any of those uses within the past 12, for um, not within the past 12 months, but there hasn't been a discontinuation of use for 12 consecutive months. I have this silly, this note down here that just this year, we changed that code to 24 months. So this analysis was based upon 12 months because that was the code at the time. If they were to resubmit today, they would be subject to the 24 months. So just a little caveat there. So um, on appeal, the applicant submitted some more information and that was what I, um, my ex, um, updated exhibit 18, I went through that table, which was from the staff report to say, okay, we can verify these types of uses now, but we still have some concerns, which I'll talk about next. Um, so, um, so we were, you know, I was, staff was able to verify that the paved go-kart track is still being used consistent with prior approvals. The pavilion is being used. The bleacher seating is there. Lean to storage is there. Temporary caretaker, freight vans, shipping containers, um, and, you know, a few of the other, other items. So we were able to verify that. Originally, we weren't able to verify all of that, but we can definitely verify more, more items now. Verify that they continue, they're within the scope of the approvals and there hasn't been a discontinuation for more than 12 months. Some of the key issues that, um, some of the key issues that came up are that um, there appears to be a gap in the motorcycle use of the track. It appears that the dirt track has been expanded beyond prior approvals without obtaining required land use permits. And um, prior non-conforming use verifications and alterations did not authorize use of the track for automobile uses. So therefore, we staff determined an alteration was required. So for the motorcycle track, um, race and practice schedules were provided from 2014 to 2020. They were not provided from 2014 to 2023. Um, but there are photographs demonstrating that the track has been maintained over time and it's, it's evident that the track is being used and the applicant submitted narratives stating, yes, we use the track, we use the track for practice, definitely using the track. We just can't determine the frequency of events 
of how many events they're holding to verify that they truly are in lieu of carding events per the conditions of approval. There were also conditions of, of approval limiting the type of motorcycles that could be used. And staff wasn't able to like verify that that's still in compliance. There's definitely evidence that they are using the track, just not, we just are unsure of the frequency. So, um, Staff in our in in the decision said, you know, it appears that the dirt track has been expanded. Um, as I stated, the 2006 alteration allowed use of the paved track for occasional motor occasional motorcycle races to uh, occur in place of karting. And um, then here's my next slide: are the conditions. So motorcycle racing shall be limited to the, to the existing paved track and extension of the track as shown on the site plan. And then it says you know, that dirt, the dirt section located immediately to the west of the first turn of the existing track on the, and north of the most westerly section of the existing track. This is from the 2006 decision. So this site plan is the site plan from the 2006 application materials. It's, I apologize, it has been scanned. So the quality is, <laughs> is reduced. There's a um, there somewhere, I know it. Yeah, so I put this red arrow here. And so there's a circle. This is, they were, you know, it was a very, anyway, so there's a circle I, here. Do you see it? I, I do. Okay. So I can see the rough outline of where the river is. It yes. goes around that. That's such an unusual shape. I'll never forget yeah. that. So, so I see the track inside it. And then I see that's the approved extension where the arrow is. I, I believe yes because in the in the the site plan submitted this was with the 2006 alteration and then there this it, there is a like a permanent marker cir permanent marker circle right here yeah and then and here's a here's a 2007 aerial photo which I don't know if that helps with the grainy black and white so can you see my cursor right here yes so this is the area that I believe is that has been circled which is the the dirt the paved dirt track which is okay. adjacent to the to the um I'm sorry this is the dirt track adjacent to the paved track and this is 2007 and this is a 2006 site plan so here's that corner here all right and here's that corner here and here's the dirt track and you can see there's plenty of vegetation along the pudding river there this is a 2012 um, aerial photo. Again, this is the area um, in the circle of the 2006. And um, then so let me just scroll down here. So here's a 2015 aerial photo. And this, this I believe right here is that where that circle was, where the where the approved part was. And as you can see, there's some vegetation starting to be removed and it looks like the track is now going through here. Okay. And then this is 2016, 2018. Again, this is uh, where the, the circle was on the, oops, sorry, on the 2006 um, site plan. And as you can see, the track now is all through here, through here as well. And then this is a 2023. Um, again, this is where the the, original approved dirt track was, and now it's been expanded through here. And then just to bring it all together, I'm not trying to, you know, so here's the 2006, this is where the track was, there was plenty of vegetation through here. Here's the 2023, the vegetation's gone and the track is here. And then this is the, a plan from the applicant's noise study, which shows the outline of the track, which is definitely larger than what appears to have been approved in 2006. So okay. in addition, this is the um, our floodplain map and the entire site is in the floodway. So, and development in the floodway is, is um, extremely restricted. You can do alterations to non-conforming uses, but a floodplain development permit with a no rise certificate would have been required to demonstrate that you are not putting in more fill or taking fill away to impact the entire floodway and the um, adjacent floodplain as well. So, and then, oh, I'm sorry, and then there's also the blue line, of course, is the river, and there is a 100-foot vegetative buffer as well um, for that. So, through the land use history, um, to expand the dirt track, an alteration of a nonconforming use was not submitted, reviewed, or approved. A river and stream conservation permit also was not, submit, not submitted, um, and a flood 
planning development permit with a no rise application with a no rise certificate also was um, has not been reviewed for that expansion. So, um, so as we discussed earlier, and as I summarized of the previous approvals, there was no um, there was no discussion of using the track for automobile use. It was just for go karts and motorcycles. So staff determined that an alteration to use the, the track for drifting would be the appropriate path to do so. This is the criteria uh, we use to review. I'll talk about number one in more detail, but number two is, as we've discussed today, we have verified that they do have a lawful non-conforming use. I have some questions about some of compliance with some of the previous conditions of approval and you know concerns about expansion of the track. Um, and then number three is pretty easy criteria that they, they are not proposing to expand the non-conforming use from one lot to the next. So the main issue here is that the applicant has a burden of proof to demonstrate that the alteration or change after imposition of conditions uh, will have no greater Im adverse impacts to the neighborhood than the existing structure other than sorry than the existing structure, other physical improvements or the use. So basically they have to demonstrate that, they're not going to create additional negative impacts uh, with their proposed alteration. So the staff decision originally discussed there were concerns with noise. Uh, the neighbors have been complaining about noises associated with the drifting. Um, so since then, the applicant did conduct a noise study and submitted that last week as part of the record. Took a quick look at it, had some questions or concerns or looking for some clarification on the noise study. Um, in the noise study, it says there are generally no more than eight drift cars on the track at any time. Um, but the noise study only gave, uh, did a sound readings for up to six, six cars at one time, but not eight. But also elsewhere in the applicant's narrative, they did say only six cars will be drifting at one time. So it, perhaps that was a typo, I'm not sure. Um, but if they do drift up to eight cars at one time, there were, there were not any noise studies provided for those. Um, and, you know, maybe clarification today or if they decide to keep the record open, it looks like in the noise study they provided, um, it said road plus dirt bikes and they provided noise readings for that. So that leads me to um, interpret that they were doing noise studies while they were having motorcycles on the paved portion as well as on the dirt portion. Um, and I just want to reiterate that expanded dirt portion was not approved. And so accepting noise readings from something that has not been approved, um, you know, so we can't consider that information as, um, as like relevant because it hasn't been approved. They don't have authorization to have expanded that track. And so the noises generated on a non-authorized use shouldn't be allowed to demonstrate that they're requested is no is no more impactful than what has been approved. So what I'm trying to say is that the track was approved prim primarily for go-karts and it said occasional use of the track for motorcycle racing. So it doesn't appear that there have been any noise studies for go-kart racing to compare to the drifting. And if you just looked at road bikes, it looks like there was just one noise reading done with noise with road bikes that appears to be less than the noise associated with the drifting. Um, and again, um, it was never intended that they would be able to, from my read of the prior decisions, it was never intended that road bikes and dirt bikes were supposed to be uh, racing at the same time. It was supposed to be mostly used on the paved track with a little extension of the dirt track. Sorry, I feel like I, okay, so. I'm following it. That's okay, fine. thank you. And then, so uh, there were conditions of approval of the types of uh, motorcycles that could be used on the track and the, uh, the, the noise study or the materials didn't verify that they, that the motorcycles used in the noise study were in compliant with the previous conditions of approval. And as I said, motorcycles uh, were used occasional and there were no noises for carding. So, so we still have some concerns um, about noise impacts at, um, uh, of, with the drifting events. And then in, my, in the decision, I talked about track impacts. Um, and so I thought I would do, I made this graphic. This is one of the applicant's exhibits. 
And so I kind of extrapolated this, 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 um, information because, um, like I took out autocross, um, and I took out some of these other events because they were, they haven't been approved. Um, an alteration hasn't been approved for them. So I took out the karting events and the motorcycle events and the drifting events, um, so I lumped like these two, the, the uh, carding events in red, I lumped together and then the larger events I called out separately. And so this was the exhibit um, 20 that you had referenced earlier today. And I just kind of tried to simplify this. So to show like, these are the number of events they had. And on average, these were the number of people that were in attendance. And I acknowledge that the applicant said, you know, they don't take a head count. They don't have, you know, they don't have a clicker of everybody that's coming. So like, this is their best guess. Um, but I just wanted to show that, yes, they did have some events in the 2000s. You know, they had a one event here and two events uh, in 2004 where over a thousand people came. But when you go back down to when they started the drifting, um, as you can see, they were hosting up to 14 drifting events um, each year, and they said they had anywhere between 500 to 1,000, 2,000, 2,500. What was unclear is, is that one event with 2,000? Is it 10 events with 2,000? Either way, per these numbers, it yeah. appears that the traffic impacts are increased traffic to the site for the number of attendees, even if they come like multiple people in one car, 2000 people coming to three show, three events is much more traffic than, you know, 250 people coming to like four carding events. So, um, so there is, appears to be much more traffic, a much a greater traffic impact with the increased attendees um, to the site. Um, and additionally, the, the, um, a traffic study wasn't wasn't submitted. Um, you know, they did say, yeah, we're going to swap out events, but it which is great. But when you have more people attending event or participating in event, that still is going to generate more traffic. So um, so staff continues to recommend denial um, of the proposed alteration upon finding that um, the applicant didn't demonstrate the burden of proof that the alteration will not input will not create greater impacts to the neighborhood. Additionally, I forgot to mention is that also development in the floodway without a no rise certificate potentially, you know, if 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 that elevation has been increased, that 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 can create an impact to flooding for the neighborhood as well. So um it appears that there'll be increased traffic from greater number of attendees and um, participants in drifting events. The noise study didn't compare drifting noise to the go-karts. The noise study did not provide readings for eight cars drifting at the same time. Um, uh, the noise study included measurements of unauthorized uses on the dirt track. Um, draft, the applicant didn't address how traffic impacts would be addressed with increased attendings, attendees of the drifting events. And the applicant did not address increased noise on the site from having significantly more people at the event. However, if the hearings officer uh, approves the requested alteration to allow drifting, there is a criteria that says conditions of approval may be imposed um, on any alteration to a non-conforming use um, to alleviate the adverse impacts. So. Uh, conditions of approval could be lim could be adopted, limiting participants and attendees, limiting hours and days drifting is allowed, limiting the number of events that can be held, requiring replanting along the river to assist with noise buffering, or and, and of course incorporating conditions from the prior non-conforming use approvals. And then I just wanted to point out one I I acknowledge in the staff report I, the applicants' materials provided information on a bunch of events that have not been approved prior. I understand that they're not requesting approval of that through this application, but they are in the application materials. So that's why I called out to say, yep, these show up in the application materials, but they haven't been approved. That includes like the concerts, the warrior dashes and events like that. So that, do you have any questions? Oh, I've been asking questions as we go along and thank you for <laughs> patience in addressing them. It's to me makes more sense to do it as we go along because yep. that's when it's happening. Right. So, um, Mr. Smith, Mr. Egger, did I pronounce that correctly, Mr. Egger?
timeline. Go ahead. Yes, you yes, you said it correctly. I'll, I'll keep him muted until we're going to go there. Thank you. Yes. And Mr. Smith, uh, I'd like to provide you the same opportunity to provide uh, evidence and information and uh, advocacy on behalf of the applicant. Thank you. Yes, I will share my screen. Um, and I'll note uh, just for the record and for your honor that we have um, had Mr. Egger um, sign and verify our um, our narrative as all um, evidence as well, um, his his testimony. Okay, uh, I, and I prefer Mr. Cox, if you will. Okay, Mr. Cox, thank you. Let me go here. Okay, can we see the site plan notes there? It's great. I see site plan notes. It's a it's a aerial photo with uh, uh, designated arrows and uh, descriptions. Yes, thank you. Um, I will um, just before we get um, started um, point out that yes, this application was filed as we wrote in our narrative. This file this application was filed under Zoning Development Ordinance One Two O Six O Seven, which as you know has four approval criteria. Uh, it doesn't have other approval criteria outside of that. Um, and these decisions have to be based on the approval criteria. So we, we want to focus on those as we're moving forward here. Um, and I'm glad Ms. Nesbitt clar um, clarified that this was not about verifying prior uses because that's uh, that goes against other provisions of the Zoning Development Ordinance. This is about clarifying uh, which uses uh, clarifying the motorcycle use, and we and we literally expressly asked for an alteration um, for the drifting. So there was definitely some confusion between the original application and staff because we did not ask for um, you know anything you know the verification which comes from a different provision of of the code. Um, but we will note for the record that the. A uh, cessation of the motorcycle use that was mentioned. Um, anybody that lived in Oregon in 1996 realized we had a larger than 100 year flood. Um, so the uh, from 1996, there had to be a new permit applied for. And the motorcycle racing that was discussed at that point in time was the oval track. Uh, we put in the narrative, the oval track was farther up north. But there had always been um, regular dirt. Those were so they were called super speedway uh, bikes, and they rode on the oval track. There had always been motorcycle motorcycle racing in other places. So we wanted to just clarify that that's what that um, 1996 to 1999 cessation was was the super speedway motorcycles. Hang on, let me get uh, uh, some clarification to make sure that I understand what you're talking about. So I, this is a great picture of the site plan. It's very clear. I see um, what stands out to me. I see the paved area. It's very distinctive. It kind of um, snakes around in a, and it has a couple of uh, turns built into it. And it has a, that section of additional area that's closer to the... Uh, Oh boy, eh, I don't know how to describe that. Further away from the tents, I, I suppose, closer to that section of the river. All of this is surrounded by that river. Um, then you're talking about an oval track and I saw other pictures of it, but it's actually above it um, where it indicates now is now parking and storage. Is that correct? That's correct. And I'll show and that. Um, that was marked as Exhibit 8 on the narrative. I'll show, um, let me scroll up. And that's the, that is the racing that actually ceased. Right. So you can see here the narrative uh, points out, um, as shown in that Exhibit 8 there, that there was an oval track up north that was the super speedway. And that's the one that ceased. That's what right. those, there was confusion between those old applications, motorcycle racing that those were discussing in the 99, um, the 99 decision was talking about this oval track. Okay. So just to, to clarify that. But you're asserting here that uh, motorcycle racing continued on the uh, paved track with these 
dog leg extension, I, I guess I can call it. Correct. Correct. And we'll go through that more later. I just wanted to clarify that that was that was in relation to a natural disaster um, and that oval track, yes, has not been continued. That's, those were a different type of motorcycle. They were much louder. Um, and that was, you know, a, a nuance and a distinction that it appeared to us that the original staff report didn't recognize that distinction as to those super speedway bikes. A um, couple other things. Um, yeah, the the uh, application of uh, 1204.06 or 1206.06, so discontinuation, I believe we've disproven that, but again, that's not one of the approval criteria. So um, we don't think that's the appropriate thing to be analyzing. Um, then again, um, the testimony, and I'll go through this in a minute, I'm going to give a tour, is that the use of the motorcycles on the track and on the property is every weekend during the, during the dry season. Of course, this is, um, as you noted, has a river uh, running all the way around it. Um, but during the dry season, when it's not rainy season, the use of the motorcycles uh, on the property and on the track is every weekend um, or almost every weekend. It was weather dependent. And of course, if there's other events. Now, um, staff had just mentioned they weren't sure um, whether they were rent operating at the same time. Well, they can't, you don't have, you don't have motorcycles on the track at the exact same moment as you would have carts. You wouldn't have motorcycles on the track at the exact same times you would have drift cars. So it's, it's, I guess it's physically possible they could roll out there, but that's not what happens. So they wouldn't be, you know, they wouldn't ever be on the track at the same time. Um, then a couple other things to note before we get too far into it. The floodplain, re floodplain requirement from the Clackamas County Code was adopted in 2014. That is, uh, what, uh, eight years after the 2006 permits and the 2017 permit. So we, you know, if there are new requirements, um, we would be grandfathered in to the prior Wait, requirements. Uh, I think you changed topics on me and I wasn't quite there yet. Uh, can you go back to talk about, were you talking about the the floodplain? Yeah, yeah there was, uh, my my understanding and the, um, is that staff has had concerns about um, quote unquote development in the floodplain. Um, and there's a there is a Clackamas County um, ordinance on that, but that was adopted. One that we're aware of was adopted in 2014, which was after the approval of the motorcycles to the west side of the track. And so, if there's something new, then we we would look at that and we'd want to be aware of that. But it's our understanding that the um, the track that was approved um, in 0607, um, you know, would mm -hmm. have pre-existed that 2014 code. And that wouldn't apply. But plus, we have we don't believe we've done any developments as they're defined there. It says any new. They believe that code provision says any new um, construction, new structures, um, and so that we we just don't think that one applies. If it applies, certainly we could we'd comply with it and discuss that. But um, when it, it wasn't it was, well, wasn't cited and it wasn't one of the approval criteria. And, and I, I'm not I'm not making a finding here. Just I'd just like to talk a little bit about. Uh, your, that floodplain area. So Ms. Nesbitt indicated it's 100 feet setback from the river development within that area. And development includes vegetation removal, grading, uh, those type of activities as well. So um, I would think that, uh, you know, that, that, you know, would still be development. Development's not just building a building or a, or a road. It also involves grading and vegetation removal, but please, please move on. I just no, I'm with you, Mr. Cox. I'm with you 100 um, percent. That provision of the Clackamas County Code was adopted in 2014. There oh. was a condition and we've cited that condition that said um, no. It said something in the effect of I don't want to misquote it. No new. Um, I'll go through it during my tour in a minute, but it sure. talks about no new. Um, stuff over there and that's that was in the decision um about approving motorcycles right so the existing state of affairs there wouldn't be new and the existing track and the, the track wouldn't wouldn't have been new that's our point the 2014 mm -hmm. requirement is 
that's part of the code is different than the condition that was established in 2007. Ah. Um, okay, so with that, let me give you a little bit, um, and I'll have Mr. Egger verify the different types of motorcycles, but that's that again, that goes to the super speedway as opposed to the uh, motorcycles that go on the on the asphalt track and or on the dirt. Um, and the reason we don't, don't have a clicker is because none of the, the decisions prior to that um, never you know, had a head count limitation, never had a, a capacity limitation. And our proposal is to stay with the, um, you know, the same use as we've, as we've always had the same capacities. And I noticed on the, on the measurements, there was recognition that there had been, you know, 1800, 2000 people at some of the events over the years going back, you know, 20 plus odd years. Um, and that's not a, that we, we do not intend, we don't ask for, and we don't expect that to change in any way, shape or form which is why we didn't, you know, there isn't a head cap limitation. There isn't currently a parking limitation. Um, and so we want, expect, um, and hope that the traffic will remain the same. We didn't do a traffic study, of course, because we're not anticipating any additional traffic, uh, probably less, because again, when cars come in, you don't have, um, that's how people get there. It would, and when you're having a motorcycle or a car race, there has to be another vehicle that brings them in there. Um, so our, our plan, our hope, our desire is that it would be the same. So we don't think any, there's gonna be any traffic difference. If it takes a condition to establish that, that's, that's what we're planning and wanting anyways. So let me give a little bit of a tour if I can. Um, first, yes, our, our request here is is that we have we affirm and clarify that motorcycle racing off of the paved that paved asphalt was known and approved in that 2006 decision and continues to be approved use of the site um if you know if there is going to be an exact location of that you know that seems to be the dispute is where the where is the exact location of that uh the staff's original um report quoted and i, I quoted them in the narrative that motorcycle racing off track was never approved. Well, that's simply not, not true. We, we've cited and uh, quoted those positions or uh, those portions of the earlier decisions. And now staff, uh, I believe in, in staff's report recognizes that, that um, motorcycle racing was specifically and expressly approved. Our second request is simply an alteration mm -hmm. of the existing approval uh, to use the paved track to add drifting, which again, does add a vehicular, an automobile to that track. Um, and I'll go through the, the pictures of the track, but as the, uh, Mr. Cox, you'll see, is that it's it's a much narrower. This is not, you know, this is not NASCAR here. We're talking about a, a relatively narrow asphalt track um, that can take, you know, it probably can, could actually take at max eight. Eight is not really ever used out there. That is why, the entire application and our request asks for six. That's why the noise study used six. Um, and I'll, I'll show that in just a minute here. So um, just I just want to pause for just a moment. So you are clarifying that the application here is uh, no more than six. Yeah, we even we even offered um, to condition it to six if necessary. Um, I think we'll see from the sound study yeah, we'd, we'd like eight, um, but the, I think you'll see from the sound study, what the engineers concluded um, with respect to um, some of the houses that I'll show later and then nearby and this the study and the measurements from some of the houses, they, mm -hmm. they literally said, it doesn't make the difference what goes on on that property. It's not gonna cho change the noise effect um, to those houses. And then there was um, uh, residents one, two, and three where there would be some noise, but the noise from the drifting was lower or equal to um, the use of the track on the motorcycles. And again, I'll clarify that because a uh, staff- But staff you said had, both ways. You did say six, but then you also said eight again. And I, I don't want to get it wrong, Mr. Smith. I, if your request is six, then I want to make that correct in my notes. But yeah. if it's eight, then yeah. I want to consider eight. Which is it? 
I Okay. Would you like a moment to confer with your client, sir? Yeah, let me do that real quick. Uh, but just put on mute and, and give it a give it a minute. All right. Yeah, um, thank you. We're ready. Um, so we were just clarifying that originally the noise study was, um, and I'll go through the noise study in a minute, but to, just to clarify, there was going to be eight cars out there um, and, and do a, a segment with eight, but two of the cars broke at the time. But what we'll point out in the noise study is that it didn't make a difference in the level of noise, how many cars were out there. And so I'll go through that and I'll show the engineers uh, reports on that. So we're asking for it to be to have at least the approval to use eight, but we're fine, you know, functionally, we're fine if it's six. So if it needs to be conditioned, we're fine with a conditioning to six because we understand that's what the noise study actually tested. Um, but we think as the engineer's uh, analysis points out, the amount of cars didn't out there didn't change, uh, didn't change the noise. Okay. Um, so again, I'm going to go to the, site plan, we can see the existing locations, uh, the dirt track, uh, their storage containers, we pointed those out in parking areas. Uh, nice. We noted in there the 20 foot, 22 foot wide paved driveway um, on that. Um, and I'm gonna take around some of the other areas on the property so we can get a visual here. Okay, this is the track. Okay, so we can see it's an asphalted paved track. Um, you know, we can see the path from the aerial views, and that's that's the track. Um, there was conversation about the bleachers and the, a number of attendees. Okay, so this is the only set of bleachers. Okay, so um, this is not some sort of you know a, a stadium. This is not some sort of you know these are, these are the bleachers. This is where the observers would be able to sit. Um, so just to give us a, a comparison for the scope of, of the events there. Um, the scoring booth that was in conversation. So this is the scoring booth. You can see it fits two chairs. Uh, there was a size limitation on it that's been complied with. Um, you can see the flagging tower there where somebody would stand to flag um, the outside of the scoring booth. Is right there. That's the outside of that same building. Okay, so the uh, mechanics and storage tent that was approved. That's the inside of it. You can see where the carts and um, you know parts and those kinds of things are stored and worked on. There's the outside of that same tent. You can see it can it comes out. Um, as to the pavilion, pavilion is not something particularly fancy, but it's basically the customer service counter where people check in and check out. There on the other side of the pavilion, oops, other side of the pavilion has um, a safety video and places where people um, can you know get accessories and th um, parts for their or lubrications and uh, things for their carts. Um, that's the extent of the uh, pavilion. Um, then we can go and see the dirt track. Okay, so the dirt track, this was uh, here in 2004, spring. Um, and I'm gonna show later, uh, but it's relevant to point out now, obviously in, in the early spring, there's a lot more vegetation than there is in late fall. Um, things dry out. So it makes a difference. And I'll show this later, what time of the year you're taking the picture because the grass 
and pictures, the grass dries up and, and goes away. During the wet season, it's it's much more prevalent. And I see and a bunch of deciduous trees, so. Yeah. So, I mean, the, to the, the claims that there's been removal of vegetation, um, you know, I guess theoretically, if you're talking about, you know, wild grass, okay, that might be one thing, but uh, the, you'll see historically the pictures, the trees have stayed in the same place. I'm going to go through some of the pictures over the last two decades. Um, and so we can see in... Um, well, it, it it does appear that there may be an issue around, and I'm not making a finding here. This isn't the issue we're talking about today, but I can see where you may need some uh, a no rise certificate for the grading work that's going on through here to make sure that you haven't brought in additional fill material and elevated, you know, the one property, which can cause flooding events on neighboring properties. That's that's the whole issue there. So just. Right. I think it's still, I want to make sure that the property owner is considering these kind of things and knows that there's a process to go through before you grade or do vegetation removal on a property, particularly when it's adjacent to a river in an identified floodplain floodway area. And that uh, it's important to um, follow that process because your neighbors can be harmed by um, not following. And Mr. Cox, uh, yes, Mr. Ed Edgar definitely knows that. Uh, what wasn't mentioned was there was a state uh, application in 1997 after the floods for uh, significant bank removal and stream restoration. So that's definitely known and complied with and, and done. Uh, oh, thank you, sir. And you jogged my memory. I did read that, that there was an application in for uh, repair of the, uh, the riverbank, yeah. And yes. a part of that was um, a, an agreement to plant considerable um, vegetation on the riverbanks. And, and that's absolutely something that um, he knows about and you know, does and wants to continue. Um, so I go to um, uh, page 128 of, of exhibit eight uh, or 18, I'm sorry. And again, this is 2000. And I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but this entire area to the west of the track, you can see. Um, Should move the, your cursor. Oh, I see it now. No. You can see this entire area here has track usage in it. Uh, you can see tracks going through. You can see the tree lines. You can see, you know, where the trees are at. You can see the areas uh, notably. Hey, Chris, is this showing my cursor? Yeah. So you can see these areas where there there aren't trees, where there isn't. There's there's the dark stuff, and then you can see the vegetation and you can see where it's just grass and that's 2000 let's go to okay again we can see 2000 different aerial view different time of the year in mean, different perspective you can see um in that area down there there's some trees you can see four of them in there and you can see more of a cluster in there and you can see the trees in between the dirt track and the um um, paved track. Uh, next one that we had was 2006, which was brought because it was relevant to um, the other applications. You can see in here again. There's there's track in the this area, and there's you can see um, down here. This is June of 2006. And again, see the trees, and you can see where it's grass or brush. You can see the distinction there. Um, then we can go to, and you can hold, see the trail. And, and just hold on. This is a great picture of that site. And I can clearly see the asphalt and I can see where it's, it connects in a couple of spots. And the dirt portion of it, what is the actual approved dirt portion here? Well, um, it was the, the, the expanded piece. I, I I think there was a, you know, some, um, what would be the best way, some uncertainty. Staff had quoted there be as being, um, as talked about in a site plan, but that's not what I read in the uh, conditions. The conditions from 2006 that I can read, the conditions of approval started on page 11, 
And it said, motorcycle racing shall be limited to the existing paved track and an ex extension of the track. See following conditions and shall occur on weekends only between nine and sunset. Motorcycles, and then it goes on. Um, so, you know, the exact location of it, um, there was staff showed a picture of a circled area. Um, maybe that somebody circled that during the hearing or uh, we don't know exactly what that is, but I don't know that there was, um, let me say it this way. The asphalt track and the location and dimensions of the asphalt track are clear. I don't believe the motorcycle track was was ever established in that um, precise of contours, you might say. So you're saying there was never a site plan that was submitted for the approval of the dirt motorcycle track? It was described in no. there as we quoted it. We We put the quotations in our narrative. Maybe I saw it that. It and says it to the west. It says to the west of the asphalt track. And then another place it says to the north of the asphalt track. And that's that's how it's described in the actual decision. Um, can you help me here? So when I'm looking at this, you know, I, I, which direction is north? Uh, the top of the picture is, is okay. basically the north. north. And then the rivers to the, the west. The rivers west. And north. <laughs> and, and north south. and south and east. <laughs> yeah. I know yeah. it doesn't help at all. Um, but I, I north from the asphalt, I'm looking north and I see maybe that that little track up there. Uh, it looks like a little mini track that's due north of uh of the picture, and then due west of the existing asphalt track is the label for putting river. I think that that helps. Okay. And again, this was 2006, right? Prior to the 2006 and 2007 applications. Okay. And I do see a, what appears a, a dirt motorcycle run that it, it looks like it's within about maybe 20 feet of the existing asphalt on the south end is where I can see it just a little bit. And then it runs up north uh, bound and it's north and uh uh, east of uh, the existing asphalt track. Um, is that correct? And it runs up. Well, they, there was tracks going, you know, through the trees and, you know, in that time period. And some of the other pictures will show them. I'm going to go some more pictures here. If okay. Can go. Um, I, I saw other pictures, but uh, this one I thought was pretty clear about it. So Yeah. And, and no, really, that's June 2006. All right. So oh. There we go to July of 2008 and you can see that you know the track there and goes in between those same trees you can again see on the west side here there's different types of vegetation um, that you can see the trees and you can see where it's just grass yep and i don't see any uh like motorcycle trails um in that area I see uh, I see clear motorcycle dirt trails to the north of that section and it runs pretty straight up north. Um I mean the river bends, but uh so so that yep, where your cursor is uh at basically on the uh north uh edge of the asphalt track if you run due east, I see where the uh, track bisects it and it continues on further north above the asphalt, correct? And yeah. Then it back. It's our contention, and what we believe the evidence here shows is that the exact contours and the exact location of where that track was on a year by year basis changes because the vegetation grows so fast and so thick. Um, you can you can barely tell where last year's was when you get back in there come springtime. So it's more of a designated area is right. what you assert, a designated location. Exactly. And so if I were to describe this, I would say that it is um, between the asphalt track and it is in the northeast section. And how close are you trying to make that area to the Pudding River? Well, I guess I, I mean, we, I, I, we're we're okay. We're it's our belief that that there was a condition on the um, the approval of it of a hundred foot zone. So that's what we think you know would be the the standard that would apply here that we'd be a hundred feet. 
Um, so if so, you would suggest, or, or what you're saying is, from the Pudding River, the high water mark of the Pudding River, uh, uh, no closer than 100 feet from that high water mark. Yeah, and that's in the condition. So that's that's the I think the appropriate uh, requirement on um, the site there. Um, right. And what about, what about that floodplain? So if the hundred year floodplain, yeah, I mean the whole thing's in the hundred year floodplain, correct? The whole property, right? Right. So the high water mark isn't really that great a term, is it? Um, how, yeah, uh, I'll puzzle over that, but I, I'm open to suggestions about how to designate, you know, the limitations of that of that area in a way that that aren't infringing upon that, uh, you know, flood pl floodway, uh, floodplain area and the setback for the river. Um, let's move on. I don't I don't want to puzzle on this all day. So here's again, um, 2011, you can see it, it, it's a little widened. There's a narrow track that's still going through those trees. You can see how thick that brush is, but then when the motorcycles go, it sort of, um, you know, cuts a, cuts a narrow path. And again, this one's at August. So later in the year, you can see how you know, the grass starts drying out and the vegetation. Um, and Garrett, again, the narrow path, you know, going um, through and around, there's path out and a path back. For instance, on this one, uh, 2012, you can't see the path back, right? But the motorcycles don't, you know, travel the same, tra don't travel opposite each other. And right? so there is a path back in, you know, in any and all of these pictures because it's a one-way track. I think I can take your word for it. Um, and I do see that the that the river does run on the south side pretty close to that asphalt. What uh, what is the approximate um, distance there? Because I mean, it, you that's see, probably that's keep going keep going west along the 20 river. twenty or thirty feet. Yeah, it's not feet. much. Yeah, uh, not much. Okay, is that a higher elevation or something that keeps that asphalt from washing out? Yeah, it's about fifteen feet, twenty feet. It's, there's a low bank there. Okay. All right, go on. Thank you. Okay. Now I'll point out, while we're looking at the motorcycle here, I want to point out, um, just because where these maps are fresh in our heads, that this the location, we're going to talk about this later on the study. Uh, M, M dirt here was the measurement on one of the dirt tracks. So it was, you know, as close to these houses as could be possible and right next to the track. And I point that out because um, it was measuring the sound, um, you know, in, in that location there, not on the asphalt track. The uh, M, M road was measuring at the asphalt track. All right, M dirt. So I get what I, I think I understand that. And I see the the sort of turquoise for the existing asphalt track. OK, yep. So we'll go through this later. But MW was one measurement site. M dirt was a measurement site. M road was a measurement site. MS was a measurement mm -hmm. site. And ME was a measurement site, you know, in all directions based on the engineer's analysis there. And I'll go through that more. But um, mm -hmm. So drifting would only take place on this asphalt track, if that's not obvious. Um, as compared to um, when the motorcycles um, are on this track, there could be up to 50 motorcycles. Um, the, the supermoto races that they've had um, on this track have, 50 mo have had up to 50, 50 motorcycles starting at the starting line at the same time. Okay, so that'd be 50 motors, motorcycles. There could be 40 carts on this track at a given time um, for a, a you know, normal, normal race. Um, and so, you know, one to eight cars on this track. So our, our point there by, by mentioning that is that that's, you know, less activity, less action, less, you know, of an, an impact on that actual um, asphalt track. The fewer users out there at a time, fewer people involved, fewer users creates fewer guests. 
uh, those kinds of things. So as we go to, you know, what the approval criteria. And I want to get something in my notes. I did get that you said uh, up to 40 cards races at a time. And I know you're talking about up to eight, but possibly only up to six uh, cars. How many motorcycles did you say you race at a time? Up to how many? Up to 50. Well, that's what I thought you said. And, but yeah, thank you. So again, we believe the applicable approval criteria are ZDO 1206.07. Uh, that's what the application, the permit, and that's what you know should be applied here. And B is what applies here. So there's the three requirements there. And we're going to address those three criteria. Uh, but as staff had mentioned, um, the non-conforming use status was verified. It was verified in 1999. It was altered in 06 and it was altered in 07. So it's already been verified. So that's that's done. Um, the alteration, number three, alteration or change will not expand the non-conforming use from one lot of record to another. Again, that one's not applicable here. So really what we, what we are focusing on and ask um, Officer Cox to focus on is that the alter, whether the alteration or change will after the imposition of conditions, if you deem any necessary, and pursuant to uh, subsection 12607B4, have no greater adverse impact on the neighborhood than the existing structure. Other in physical improvements, not really applicable. Existing structure, not really applicable, or the use. Okay, Staff's original report, you'll notice, and we cited to it, said that we didn't prove that there was a smaller impact. Right, it's that we can't have a greater adverse impact. And the noise report that we have now does, in fact, show that it would be a, um, a less. So we think that the real um, only factor here that really applies is noise. You know, noise. We, you know, we are happy to and welcome to continue the exact same level of traffic. If that needed to be, um, you know, calculated in some way or conditioned in some way, there's. There's not going to be, not expected to be, we're not asking for any increase in traffic or change to the traffic, not any change to parking, not any change to the amount of vehicles, amount of guests, anything like that. Uh, so uh, as we were just talking about the noise study, um, again, the key findings from the noise study as the measurements. Now I'll take note here, these green the noise study labeled all the residences um, that were potentially applicable R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, R6, R7, and R8, and then R9. So the measurements were taking place in between um, the uh, tracks and the use. Now the key findings from this, that should be the takeaways, is the track side noise level, that, that means within 50 feet from each of the track for mm -hmm. all types of racing was less than 105 decibels, which is less than the state limit for, for racetracks in OAR 340.035. Now we'll note, um, staff did, didn't seem to, um, table four here, I wanna point out table four, because there was combinations, every combinations that we could think of um, was run out there. These are the segments, the 12 different segments, um, you know, measurements with just dirt bikes, measurements with just on the, on the asphalt track bikes, measurements with the road and dirt bikes, measurements with on the track and dirt bikes, measurements, motorcycle, um, the road there is motorcycles, motorcycles and dirt bikes. So here drifting um, is shows how many cars. Each time the drifting is showing how many cars there were. So that's the three types. It's all three types. And there's some isolated by themselves. There's some done um, in conjunction with the other. And there's some done, well, that's the two. That's the only ways they can be. So it's both isolated and together. So that, that, that concern, I think staff had called it, is addressed there. There was... Um, just racing on the asphalt track that was compared to what would be drifting. And there's no contention by 
you know, anyone that we can't use the asphalt track, right? So that that noise, and those noise levels are the same. Now, step, the engineers point out why that really doesn't matter. But um, there's a second main point they have that I want to point out is the second main point the noise engineers concluded, that the noise study found that for the residents R4 to R9, again, R4 to R9, which are south and east, they do not change to any noticeable degree for bikes or drifting. I think the way the engineers wrote it down in their report on page 12 was regardless of what's taking place. Um, it's just the way the contour and the noise works out there. For houses to the west, R1 and R3, what they found was that the noise spectrum was different but that the drifting noise was equal to or quieter um, for drifting than it was for the bikes in all octave bands. And that was again, the, the exhibit nine, page 12. And then they also noted that drifting up to six cars on the track meets the requirements of ZDO 120607B1, which is the no, uh, no change requirement. Now they studied the ambient noise as well and threw that into their report. All right. And that limit that's referenced in table four is the OAR. I didn't look it up. I'm just asking. The 105? Yeah. Yes, that comes from the OAR. That's what if if it's it's an oh it's one of those OARs for noise. You as a land use officer, you probably know about they don't enforce, they don't really apply them, but now they're used as guidelines. The I mean, you know, it's it's a non um non-enforced data they've defunded all that stuff a handful of years ago but that's what it would be and this would be below it the 105 anyways <clears throat> okay so now let's get into the noise study a little bit here um so it's abd engineering and design um they're <laughs> they're one of if you've ever searched for noise um engineers in the state of oregon they're one of the few one of the lead uh, one and one of the best they're all INC board certified, um, and they used the um, their device. The where's the devices listed? I'll show it later. They used all the proper proper devices. Um, might be in the next slide here. Um, and they did break it down because we, we recognize that um, it's a it's a it's a it's a different type of noise. The, the squealing of the tires from from drifting is different than the you know engines of a motorcycle or or a, um, a car. Um, but so they measured. We had them measured by different levels. They had the L1 level, the L10 level, and the L50 level, which is you know a more expansive study measuring at these different um, range levels then you know what might be done on on a lot of applications or noise studies um and so that the l1 level is for short-term noise events a loud horn or an airplane passing by the l10 level is mm -hmm. sort of frequent noise a, a recurring noise and l50 is more of the continuous noise we had to measure at all of those and those that's in, interwoven into um the graphs that they have in a minute here so again the um locations here um this matches up you can look at this later but this covers all the residences that you know were are in inside of the relevant range of 2500 feet um there probably are some that are further out than that but those were the ones within 2500 feet um, now the comparisons. Um, well, let me sc scroll back up here to now yeah, there's the results. Okay, so the ex uh, explanation of the comparison. 
of why we did this study. So the comparison um, was the existing permitted and proposed activity. So regardless, our staff talked about, okay, well maybe using an expanded track isn't an approved activity. Really doesn't matter. Um, as we pointed out, the graphs, the sound for all of them was roughly the same, right? Here we have um, dirt bikes, 95.8, 98.9, um, road bikes, 96.5, uh, road and dirt bikes, 97 at that measurement place, 95 at that measurement place. You know, all of these are somewhere in between 99, which is the was was the highest measurements down here, to 94 was the lowest measurements. I um, mean, just the loudest. These measurements were the loudest noise that took place at all during that testing period. So that's what those represent is the single highest noise that got there. Um. So again, here they the. Engineers gave a comparison of the overall sound levels and how those, you know, are um, are compared. Their graphs here. I'll go through in a minute. So the graphs here showed that um, the range, I'm reading the last paragraph here, the range of the overall A-weighted levels with drifting activity was primarily within the range of levels for the permitted bike activity at each location, regardless of the metric that was chosen. Um, there, that gave them the conclusion that as defined in the decision, the noise associated with the drifting was no greater than the noise associated with the existing authorized racing at the site. And that site, the drifting activity would have no greater adverse impact to the neighborhood than the existing use. So you can you can tell from these graphs here. Figure four, what figure four shows as described here, you know, on the bottom of this page that location MW was the only location where racing noise was noticeably louder than the background levels. The racing noise at M and S and M and E was much less audible due to the background noise level. MS was down by the road and ME, I'll go um, show that one again, um, was background noise level, that's the street. That's over, down, over by the street. The street makes a, um, a right angle turn or the left hand turn there going away from the um the facility so that's where uh, we talked about before um their one of their conclusions is is it doesn't really make a difference what's taking place at the track when you're in that direction um so I wanted to read. Um, so here the the dirt track. So you can see the dirt track. If you're just just comparing, probably the most simple of these. I'm not a noise engineer, but the simple of them, the, the track side noise of the dirt track by itself, ninety five point eight, ninety eight point nine. Um, the track side noise when the dirt track is being run is the lowest of, you know, either, you know, running their motorcycles on the track or the drifting. Um, so for purposes of analyzing, there's an impact by where the track is located or whether the dirt track is used. The measurements right next to the existing dirt track would be the same as the measurements, regardless of whether the dirt track was moved over 20 feet or 40 feet. Um, the exact tra track mm -hmm. location, the, the, the site where the dirt track would be located. 
Um, then if we go to Again, looking here where the road was being raced with, by motorcycles and the dirt was being raced by motorcycles at the same time, we notice there's no appreciable increase, right? We've got um, road bikes at 96.5 um, here between 10 o'clock, 10.21 and 10.32. And you've got here, 10.04 to 10.21, it goes down at the same time as dirt bikes are being raced around the dirt track. And so we can see that there's not any um, increase in overall noise, even if both are being used at the same time. Next, um, the drifting noise is the same or less than the motorcycle noise. Um, page, the 71st page of exhibit 18 shows those figures 5A, B, C, and figure six, which is down below, uh, point that out. So we can see this engineer's lines here. Um, the solid blue line is the measurement of the for the bike. The dashed blue line is a measurement for drifting. And the um, uh, boxes are the ambient noise from the measurement locations. So one of the conclusions page 72 for houses to the west which was R1 and R3 the noise spectrum is I already read that one okay and then Okay, so here's the one I mentioned earlier. Uh, engineers wrote, as can be seen by the figures at locations MS and ME, the background level is nearly identical to the level with the bikes and with drifting. The same holds for the L1, the L10, and the LEQ graphs. This indicates that regardless of what is happening at the facility, the levels to the south and east, R4 and R9, will not have, will not change to any noticeable degree. Uh, now, if you look at the what our quotation from the um, 2007 decision on the motorcycles, they basically said the same thing. Whether you're running the motorcycles on dirt or on asphalt is not going to change the noise. There wasn't a no noise study then, but that just seems logical. It's sort of common sense. If you're, you know, if you're running it on dirt or you're running it on asphalt, the engine is. So I'll go to the noise study conclusion here. Um, so the ABD engineers in this noise study studied this, you know, with the you know highest possible engineering techniques available, and found that the proposed drifting is similar in level to the noise generated by cart racing or motorcycle racing. Therefore, it would meet the requirements and not be a greater impact. Um, Again, the prior conditions, you know, the um, the hundred foot is the is the one condition that you know um, could be could be measured. You know, keeping to that hundred foot condition is the one that you know could be you know maybe measured and um, used as the measuring stick here. And that's what we'd we'd propose is that the motorcycle racing um, there be some some markers or something like that so that the motorcycle racing can be remain you know, in that 100 foot, um, you know, if there are, I guess, state licenses or state permits for non-rising, um, certainly it'd be make sense that those would have to be complied with and could be done through a condition of approval. Um, but again, the prior conditions did not have any discussion or I guess should say a condition or capacity limit on attendees, parking, the actual noise, Staff's report talks a lot about the frequency of the events or the number of attendees at each event. That was not one of the conditions. Uh, to you know, in theory, with a vested rights analysis, a constitutional rights analysis, if if 
the county wanted to take a permitted right away, there would have to be a notice and opportunity to be heard to somehow reduce their usage, take away their usage, um, stop their usage, um, and that that didn't happen. So, um, you know, conditions of approval can certainly do that, but to go through some sort of a, um, to say, well, on year four, you had four events, and year five, you had three events, so therefore you're permanently limited to three events, is not the right analysis. That's not appropriate under land use law nor constitutional law. It's it's not one of the criteria. Um, you know, so there was some some conversation about that in staff's report, but you know, it's it's the condition on the use. As long as the use has not discontinued for the 12 month or the 24 month, and the testimony of Mr. Egger, the exhibits have shown that the use has has continued, other than the oval track. All the racing uses continued since prior to 1999, which was when he filed his first verification. Um, so discontinuation here is not an issue. When, when staff highlighted boxes on the, um, the, you'll note in the narrative, it's called a sampling of the events we've had um, and and the size of those events. It was a sampling. We didn't give the we didn't even give the dates or. Why not? Because the dates of the exact events is irrelevant. The frequency of the events is irrelevant. Fact is, it was being used. It was being used, you know, six days a week, somewhere between seven and nine months out of the year, every, you know, every year since 1999, for motorcycles on the track, including off the track and carts. Um, so. From that perspective, there's no discontinuation. That's not even appropriate to be looking at right now. The frequency is not appropriate to be analyzed because there was no criteria established that, you know, if you, you know, do more in year one and less in year two and more in year three, year three's use would somehow be prohibited. There's not a measuring stick that we would even have to use um, to do something like that. You froze up briefly. Um, you know, sometimes in these land use hearings, I've been a land use um, planning chair in two different cities. You can discuss conditions. We're open to this to um, conditions. You know, hypothetically, if we limited the amount of cars that can be parked there, oh, and and again, yes, some of the events are quite large. You know, there's been big concerts there. There's been um, adventure races, but those apply for different permits, right? Those are, those I understood are, that. I did have a yeah, little yeah. brief question about that. I, it, you referenced that you get separate permits for that, and that's just you. So you use it like uh, somebody has an event permit for one event, and you right. your permit, and you and you set it up in accordance with the permits, uh, doing whatever is required. I, I didn't really have that. I, I, and I those are actually mostly uh, third parties. Third parties oh. are the ones that come and do that, and then. You know, asked to use the facility. Those are those are not. You want to use your facility to have a concert, and you right. say okay, but you've got to go get the permit and show it to me before you do it, and et cetera, et cetera. Yes, we mentioned those because that shows some of the scale of the capacity that this is able to handle and regularly does handle. Right, one of the conditions from um, forget which year it was was to asphalt and and so the make the road is wider. So it's a nice, uh, we have the pictures of those, that the entry road is is wider and you know, complies with modern traffic. And that was, you know, going quite, quite some time ago. So a condition on, you know, the maximum amount of automobiles, you know, or the max drifters there being six, we, you know, we wouldn't um, have too much heartburn if there's something like that. But again, um, it's, it's one track, right? We have to, you can only have, you know, typically they'll have, if they're going to have an event, so let's say it's, um, you know, a drifting event or it's a moto cart um, event, that'll be like the main thing for that day. Maybe when it's over, then the motorcycles go out there and the motorcycles would run for a while, yeah. you know, or on an average practicing day, they might have it in stages, right? The people that are want to be out there practicing with their carts um, would go out and they'd go for the first hour. And then people that want to practice motorcycle racing would go out there for the second hour. And so yeah. there, there isn't 
And there never was a condition that you have to have one schedule for every weekend and stick to that schedule. So, you know, some of the staff report was very confusing about that. It's like, we don't, we can't tell whether they're at the same time. Well, the testimony that's before, you know, your uh, sorry, Officer Cox uh, is that they're not, the, those three types of vehicles are not and won't be on the track at the same time. That's not safe. That's not appropriate racing etiquette. That's just not. What's the what's the parking service surface if you don't mind my asking? Um, well, the, the parking service is surface is everything. There's grass. There's uh, gravel. Um, so I have some of the pictures that we didn't go through today, but are in the packet show the background. There's there's some ancillary things. There's there's approval for during race weekends people to come and temporarily stay in an RV. That's grass. There's places where these containers are um, stored, where the, some of the people put their um, their carts or their motorcycles. Those are mostly in the gravel, um, and then there's areas in between and around there that people, you know, can 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 and do park in because they're not in the same area. You can see from the pictures there, they're, they're the, spread out. Does the fire department ever take a look at your parking situation and the you know the fire department? All the time. Let me um let me bring Mr. Egger on. There was a couple of things I wanted him to explain. Um I'm gonna mute myself. I'll stop sharing my screen. Morning, and, Mr. Yeah, and if you could, if you want to talk about the parking and then um, just drifting in general. Tell us a little bit about drifting. And what? Well, let, me, let, me, let me ask Mr. Cox's question first off. With regards to the fire Mr. Smith, would you mute, please? Are in contact with them a lot. They come down a lot. When we have big events, uh, they'll come in and help coordinate things. Um, a lot of the bigger events, they want a pre-check done, make sure the ambulance path is there. Uh, so we coordinate with those guys all the time and have a great uh, relationship with them. Um, with regards to the frequency that they're there, unfortunately on the dirt bike track area back there, injuries are very frequent and we usually see them every weekend. So we have procedures in place with them. Um, it's never been real serious accidents, but a lot of broken ankles, broken collarbones and stuff. But we work with them, um, all of the tent, the temporary tent structures that are up are in compliance with them. They have all of the manufacturer's stamping on their records. Uh, probably less than four or five months ago was our last inspection that the fire marshal from Canby came out went through everything. We uh, worked together. He gave us some recommendations on things he wanted changed. We changed them and we're in constant contact with them. Uh, regarding the parking, we've got pastured areas. I'll call pastured areas. They're just grassy field areas that we do parking in. We park in the gravel. Um, in the past when we've had big outside events that Mr. Tyler referred to, um, we have parked at adjacent areas. Uh, one of those events is uh, a concert event called Hair Fest that actually is going on at the Clackamas County Fairgrounds this weekend. That's an event that we had 3,500 people on, on site for you know, a number of days, most of them coming and going, but there was camping involved. And, and those were applied for outside permits, the warrior dashes, those were third parties that obtained, at least showed me copies of permits that they said they'd obtained. Um, so that's a little bit of a clarification there. Um, as far as just kind of giving you a, a little bit of clarification on some of the things that have been discussed. Um, so when we took over the facility back in 98, uh, in 99, we realized that we needed to make sure that we were documented on what the uses were. Uh, we went through the hearings, some non-conforming use hearings. We were, you know, uses were granted, certain things were denied. 
um, moving forward from that point. Um, well, in the, the 99 decision, actually part of that came up because there was an additional motorcycle track that had been put in that wasn't connected to anything else. It's called a super speedway motorcycle is, is the type of bikes they race. That came into question because of the noise levels and additional use and all that. And we uh, lost the use of that facility. That was very, and there's some wording in that 99 decision that caused some confusion if you don't know the history of the existing tracks and the new track. There was a portion in there where it says, no carts, dirt carts, cage carts, motorcycles, et cetera, et cetera, can be run on the track at Pat's Acres. That was pertaining to that oval track. Uh, staff in the past has quoted that saying um, that you're not allowed to run motorcycles. Um, Shane Potter, three or four years ago, gave us a decision, he came out, looked, and he said, well, you can't use motorcycles. You have to stop running motorcycles. You're not approved to do that. We shut down. We lost revenue. Um, quickly, he was. it was determined that he was completely wrong because he did not look forward at the 06 decision that reiterated and established that motorcycles at Pats on the asphalt, existing asphalt track and adjacent dirt track are approved. Okay. Um, so it, it's the facility has been a racing and event facility from the get go and that was established. Again, like Mr. Smith said, there's never been a restriction on the number of events, the frequency other than six days a week, we're supposed to be quiet, nothing, no events on Mondays. Um, but but there were no, you know, other parameters really put on us. The facility has been used six days a week. Um, other than the now, the motorcycles do not run six days a week. They're limited to the weekends only, and that is what we have always stuck to. That was clarified in the 06, 07 decision. Um, the asphalt track, as far though as as go karts and other activities, has just been limited to six six days a week. Um, we, when in in the in the 06 decision, the area that we used, uh, first of all, the nature of the dirt sections for the cart track that the bikes use, they're they're ever changing. Guys, we've never built one track and left it the same for even an entire year. A lot of the time the pathways change, you know, from weekend to weekend. Um, certain parts of it will remain constant. Offshoots will be brought in, added to, taken away. And it's, it's a lot of times when that happens, it's nothing more than, um, you know, mowing right down to the nub or scraping the dirt to create a, you know, sometimes a four foot path, sometimes a 20 foot path wide where the bikes will run. There's narrow spots, wide spots. That's kind of the nature of the dirt track with the motorcycle usage. We were never constrained to a specific area or said that we cannot expand or change the dirt track. Uh, the approvals back in 06, basically one of the one of the language areas said to the west, one said to the northwest, which is consistent with where we're at now. That whole area that's being used is north, northwest, could be constructed part of it is southwest, but it's you know a generalized area. Um let me clarify my when, understanding here. When we applied, you know, so so with regards to what just, we're just trying to do now. Let me clarify that dirt section a little more. I just want to make sure we're on the same page and you can confer if you want about your answer, but uh, with Mr. Smith, but what I, um, what I hear you saying is that that dirt section, yeah, the rain comes, it floods it, it, it becomes mud and it changes year to year, but you're not bringing in fill. You're not no. 
bringing no. in a dump truck of fill. You're not taking dirt out of there. You may be um, just uh, taking dirt bikes and making a new trail through there to follow and probably building up some jumps or something. But um, but it's it, you're not adding or taking material from that section. Correct. The amount of material that's in that area doesn't change. It gets right. moved. It gets pushed over. Um, like you said, we'll make jumps, berms. We flatten them out. They go away. They're recreated. Um, it's, you know, that's kind of a, some of the time, some of the area, there's nothing moved or anything. They, they just become a trailed area where the guys ride. But All right. You know, with regards to where the high water mark is, yeah, that's hard. The entire facility goes underwater. Yeah, Most I, as soon as I said that, I, I thought that um, that's not going to be useful at all. Okay, uh, but um, there must be a a, a a bank area that you that it, it seems it's somewhat delineated. There's a there is a river there. Um, how wide is the river at its well, it, I mean, it in in the middle of the summer, it probably goes down to 50, 60 feet wide. In the winter, it can be hundreds of feet wide because it swallows up half of our property down there. Got it. Uh, all of the parking area down below, the entire motorcycle area, and part of the paved go-kart track routinely go underwater in the, in the wintertime multiple times a year. You just sit back, the water clears, we, you know, clean things up and we start operating again. It's a dirt back trail in the floodplain. Got it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So with, with regards to being constrained to a certain area, I mean, we're still within the, the designated outline area. Um, we were given that hundred foot setback from the water's edge um, back in that decision, I believe in 06, 07. Um, but there were no other constraints put on us. And clearly we've shown that that track has been in existence, uh, you know, and used at least once a year. It's truthfully, it's used, you know, seven, eight months out of the year, every year since then. And like Mr. Smith said, when the constraints were put in, other criteria and floodplain language and all that came in in 014, we'd already been operating for quite a while down in that area. So I think we were grandfathered in in that area. Um, but the other part of this application is to, is to simply add an additional use, a substitutional use to the existing uses that are there on the same paved track that's there with regards to the drifting. Um, I think the sound test is very complete. Uh, it shows that when measured against our approved uses, there the noise was the same or quieter uh, by all the metrics and locations that they took. Um, there's a there was a question about some of the combinations of well the bikes are running here, um, carts are you know, it's the uh, the the results were the results. When we go back and we look at the number of carts cars that were on track, I will address that. Um, typically, we don't have more than eight cars on track at a time. They're released usually one at a time. They're not side by side. We spread them out. Um, if you look at the results from the sound test, the additional you know noise generated by adding cars, uh, I just look between the difference between five and six cars on track was half a decibel. Basically, it, it doesn't really increase much. We had eight cars out at the facility on the day of the test, and two of them broke down, you know, before they even got on. I, you know, didn't need 10 there, didn't need 20 there. We called eight of the guys that are very regular and their cars are very typical, told them, do not modify them, leave them exactly like you would typically show up to drift for an event so that we can get sound readings. And so that was why. Uh, there was a maximum of six cars put on there. It, it would help us out if we were allowed to, you know, run eight. And again, I think the sound test doesn't 
really show that the number, an additional car or two, uh, increases the noise. But, you know, the other thing I wanted to point out is the track is in use and being used for events, practice, daily operations, whatever, six days a week. By allowing the drifting, we're not adding events or activity days on track. It would simply be pulling a previously approved activity off the track and replacing it with a newly approved activity that does not make any more noise or create any, you know, adverse, greater adverse impact on the surrounding area. So the whole thing with trying to limit the number of events, again, we're not saying, well, we normally run 60 days a year and we want to add 12 events. We run, you know, that track has stuff going on 200 days a year plus. And it's simply a substitution of pulling one type of vehicle off, putting another one on. As Mr. Smith, you know, kind of testified earlier, or explained earlier, there's never been constraints on the number of spectators we've had, the frequency of events, as long as it's, you know, in that six days a week window. And I think the morning the morning start time is between 9 a.m. and dusk or dark. Um, the, and, and here's another point that none of us have brought up yet. Typically, the go-kart track is hot for carts, bikes, whatever, um, from usually from on the weekends from 9 a.m. till either 7 p.m. or dusk. Um, the drift events in the past, we have always limited the track to a six hour window in the winter time. And typically we do one a month, one day a month. Um, in the winter time, we usually go from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. In the summertime, we go usually from either four, excuse me, from either 10 or 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. So the period in time at which we're creating noise for drift events is actually a shorter window of time that we're creating noise than our weekly, daily uh, routine. So again, it's not, we're not looking for something to add events, do more, do this. It's a substitution. And the only difference really is, you know, the kind of vehicle that's making the noise. And if it's not making any more noise than what we're making with our allowable uses, we fail to see how it has any adverse impact on what we're doing. Thank you, sir. Okay. You I'm sorry, Mr. Did you hit the subjects you wanted me to to hear? Um, yeah, there was, uh, let me look through my notes here. Yes, the types of motorcycles. So there's there's some confusion there. It it says street bikes, road bikes, whatever. We we don't run road bikes, though you know, we we run so supermoto is a category that back in 06 we got the approval for. Um supermoto is by definition. They are dirt bikes. They put, sometimes they put street tires on them. Sometimes they leave the dirt tires on them. And they run either a combination of in the dirt or on asphalt or combined. So there's, there's been some misclarification when they, when, you know, and it, it actually, if you go back to the decision back in 06, 07, there is a misprint in that that Rick McIntyre, who was the previous or a, a, a previous Clackamas County head planner guy, Rick was very, very familiar with the different types of motorcycle racing. And when that came out, none of us saw that it called out, I think it said non-modified road bikes or street bikes, something like that. We've never ran the the word the terming non motor non modified was put in there to keep us from running the speedway bikes, which were on the oval track, which are highly modified. Um, 
but there there's been some confusion um it's it's the bikes that are ran on the dirt on the pavement they're all the exact same bikes it's just a matter of tires get changed um you know the other thing that we were that we were never constrict uh restricted to was um you know, running different parts of the track, we do it with the go-karts. There's sometimes where we break the tracks into different sections. There's, you know, so the combination of the tracks that were approved get used in different combinations all the time. And right. I will address the other question that came up earlier. It was brought up, well, why did you guys not use um, go-karts for the sound reading? Um, which is a very valid question. The answer is, is twofold and it's real simple. Many of the motors that are on the go-karts are the same motors that are on motorcycles. So there's really not much of a difference. We had a real hard time within this time frame securing the, the sound company that did this. And we wanted to use them because we know they're highly respected. They're, you know, submit a lot of evidence for a lot of high profile cases and everything. Their availability was very, very, very limited on the weekends. And the weekend that we could get this put together and, and do, there was a very, very large regional slash West Coast national karting event going out on in McMinnville at another racetrack out there. And I couldn't have gotten two guys on go-karts to show up. The entire go-kart racing community was over there. But again, carts are permitted, bikes are permitted. It was, you know, just a matter of a comparison between what's permitted and what we're asking for, what's being proposed. So we feel like we, you know, provided evidence that what's permitted versus what's proposed, sound level stayed consistent. Thank you, sir. Thanks for explaining that. He's, he's giving me volume. volume. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. No, it, it, I heard. I heard it was clear. Um, is that what the applicant has for me to consider? I, I just want to make sure I heard. It looks like I went through your outline and and you touched on all the points. Yes, I think. Yes, you want to yours? Well, I'll unmute mine. I can hear. Yes, I believe so. Thank you. If there's any, you know, other testimony, um, you know, by staff or anybody else, we might want to have a rebuttal. But other than that, I think we're, we're we're complete. And thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. At this time, are there any uh, members of the general public who would like to make a comment for me to consider in making a decision here? Use the raise hand feature as was indicated. Darcy, if you're on your phone and you want to testify, do you know how they would? Star nine. Star nine. Okay. Is there somebody on their phone? Let's give it a couple minutes because not, or at least a minute, not everyone's that familiar with using uh, Zoom. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes, uh, the person on the phone has raised their hand. All right, let's hear, and please state your name and address. And it's showing that they're muted right now. Oh, let's give them a little time for that too. I've asked them to unmute, so they should be able to just click on- Hello? Hello. Go. Hello? Yes. Um, this is Dennis Calden calling. Good, uh, good morning. I had to turn my head to look at the clock to see if it had hit noon, but good morning, sir. Did <laughs> you state your address also? Yes, it's 15445 Northeast Arndt Road, Aurora 97002. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to provide you an opportunity to make comments for me to consider uh, in making a decision here today. 
And thank you for your participation. Okay. You want me to go ahead? Yes, sir. Okay, first of all, I wanted to reference a letter that I sent to Annabelle Lind, October 16th, 2023, um, regarding their request for continued or additional use. And I'm wondering, uh, is that in, in? Is that the public comment you submitted? I have it as dated October 17th, 2023, but I'm, I may have that. Uh... So it's dated 16 on my copy, but it could have been it didn't transfer until okay. I think I put it um, into the Internet. OK. Anyway, that's close enough. Um, so I just want to make sure that that was in evidence. Um, and then I had kind of three comments to make. Um, part of it is from that um, letter. But anyway, number one comment is about noise. And just for reference, we live um, across the river just west of the Pats Acres property. And so pretty much just west of where the racetrack is. Anyway, we've lived here for 31 or 32 years. And so we've been in reference for all the times that have come up and be changed. Uh, myself and my uncle were available, and I can't remember which of the meetings it was, but when motorcycles were first approved, and we had hoped that that wouldn't happen. Anyway, so from that time, when the carts are running on the track, I guess it's there now, um, we used to refer to them as kind of the buzzing bees that were at the neighbor neighbor's house over there, and it didn't seem to bother too much. I mean, you could hear them, but we could live our lives here and on the farm. Um, and then when the motorcycles got approved, it seems like their noise that they would create would be from um, two to five times as much as the carts, probably closer to two or three. Um, and then when the drift cars started racing um, without permits a couple of years ago, it seemed like all of a sudden the noise level for them went from five to 10 times as much as, as what we would get here on the property. And it was caused by the screeching of the drifts and the backfires and acceleration and deceleration. And it just made it uncomfortable and unhappy to be outside on the property. And it was running a lot of times. And so, Two years ago, we started making complaints about that noise. Um, and I, I remember Shane Potter was mentioned one place in there. And so um, he has issued some, some kind of citation to them. Um, but that needs to be looked at as well. Um, so I, I think that their noise study somehow I don't, I, seems faulty to me. Um, and particularly, I noticed exactly the day that they were doing that noise study, and I called um, Ms. Nesbitt and also Potter and um, said that they're running cars there. And so then we got back and found out that it was a test. Well, I thought that there might be, there was not very much noise. There was might be two or three cars, but I don't have any eyewitness you to say so, but the noise was much less. Didn't seem like they were running super fast. Um, and then right after they, they did that, then they had some motorcycles go on the motorcycle track that's right across the river from us. Um, and they probably had about the same amount of noise. So there's something that wasn't right there in terms of their sound test time. Second, I was I'm going to address about where that motorcycle track is, and it's right across the river from our property, and we can see them go by all the time, and there's been lots of dirt moving around. Um, I don't know about anything being brought in, uh, but they make piles and jumps and things like that, but it has also, I think it's only, it looks like to me from our side, only about 30, 30 to 40 feet from the river. So it's much closer than that 100 foot um, 
parameter that they were talking about. And then there's a couple of runoffs. So we had flooding this winter in January, and it all you could see were a couple of the motorcycle mounds. Everything else there was underwater. And then there's these drifting chutes that drift off the dirt right back into the river and make it more congested. And part of the reason is that they've said that the vegetation is about the same, but they cleared all the vegetation on our side from the track toward us in order to make that motorcycle run. And they've got a couple of different runs that go through there. Um, but it seems like it did just destroyed any any possible um, sound barrier that there might have existed. And there is a, supposed to be a citation, I think, from Potter that um, they've got a place too close to the river and they need to do some repair work there and then revegetate all along the river. Um, and then my third thought has to do with their traffic congestion and and Arnt Road is a two lane road and it's a major byway between 99 and I-5 and so we get lots and lots of traffic um, all the time where they I'll get, go out my driveway and in both directions they're just lines of cars as far as I can see which probably be about a half mile back to the traffic light in front of Pat's. Um, and so then when it becomes event days and things like that, they there's, they flood in more and more people all the time. And it just causes congestion. But the biggest thing that's um, uncomfortable for us is that sometimes you have to wait five or ten minutes to get a break in a car. And a lot of times it might just take somebody courteous enough to let slow down and let you get out. Um, so the traffic is more than typically um, on a daily basis when they have their events. And they do have lots of people when they come to the events. Uh, I know the last one that they had, it seemed like was at the beginning of COVID and it, everything was just full up there and it was supposed to be a, a closed down day um, in the state. And so I couldn't quite figure how they could get such a large gathering of people when it was that um, COVID time. Um, so that's basically the, the points that I wanted to make. And again, like I say, the noise is extensive and I'm, I'm afraid if the, the drift cars get uh, approved, then what's gonna happen is our property, because we're so close, is going to be probably lose value and not, not even be able to be sold if we needed to do that. So hopefully that, that'll give you some other information um, to weigh. Um, again, my name is Dennis Colvin, and I'm a neighbor of Pat's Acres. Thank you for participating in the hearing, and I will consider all of the comments you made. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have another public participant with their hand up? I know you indicated there were two at the beginning, so I wanted to make sure I paused if someone was working to get it. Yes, yeah, some more folks logged on. There's a Cam and Eddie, a Jarrett and a Tommy. So if any of you are interested in providing testimony, please raise your hand. This is your opportunity. Tommy, sorry, sorry, Darcy, it's your job. I'll be quiet. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Hey, um, sorry, I was unaware that this meeting was happening and uh, I was just let know by a friend of mine. Um, yeah, I just wanted to give my piece. Um, I've been driving at Pat's Acres since uh, 2015. Um, I've attended all of their um, bigger events from then until they got closed down. Um, I just want to say that for the community there, it's such a huge opportunity for growth for that area. Um, 
I think that it's a great place for people to go and get off the road with their cars and not be in endangering the public, not be, you know, not be a nuisance to, you know, the community. Um, and I can tell you from experience that when those events are happening, the amount of people that come into that community and go to your gas stations and your grocery stores and all of your local places, like, I think that is such a huge value to you. Um, so yeah, you know, I just wanted to get on here and give my piece and, you know, I hope that something can happen here and bring drifting back to Pat's Acres. Thank you. I'm sorry, did we get the address? Sorry. I wanted to get the address. That's exactly what I was asking. What's your address, sir? My address? Yes. Um, I live in Gresham. I'm outside of the area of Pat's Acres, but I've just, I've been driving there for quite some time, so. I think you can say you prefer not to give your specific address, but that you live in Gresham. If yes, you correct. receive a copy of this, however, you'll need to provide uh, an address to uh, the county. Uh, so, ahead, Ms. Nesbitt. Yeah. So, Tommy, when folks testify, then we send them a copy of the notice of the decision. So, if you're interested in the receiving a copy of the notice of the decision, if you want that by email, just leave your email address in the chat, and we will get you on our, on the list. Perfect. Thank you. Do we have another participant from the general public? I'm not seeing any more. All right. Um, Ms. Nesbitt and uh, Mr. Smith, do we have any uh, requests for to provide uh, rebuttal testimony here or rebuttal at argument? Oh, yeah, I would like to address some of the, um, I, I would like to provide a few more comments. All right, and I'll provide the same opportunity to you too, Mr. Smith, all right? So I just want to reiterate that the floodplain regulations were adopted in the 1970s, and they've had uh, various changes over time. And I want to reiterate this property is in the floodway, which is different than the floodplain. It's, okay. um, the, the, the development is allowed in the floodplain. It just has to be built above you know, the base flood elevation, and development in the floodway is very restricted. Um, however, there are provisions for non-conforming uses to develop within the flood floodway, but they just need to demonstrate with that no-rise permit. Um, and then the 100-foot setback is for the river. There's a principal river, um, we call it a perka principal river overlay. So there's a 100-foot setback for that, and that's not necessarily for the floodplain, because so those are two different applications that would be required. And I just want to reiterate that um, absolutely, when somebody comes in to modify a non-conforming use, the um dis the uh i want to say disqualification the the 12 months or the the, the 24 months to demonstrate that they haven't uh, stopped using their non-conforming use that is absolutely applicable to every single alteration that comes in because we need to take a look at what was approved make sure they're still in compliance with that approval and then you do your alteration based upon that so we always do a, a verification of the discontinuance it's not a verification of the alteration so staff was never confused about what the applicant was requesting we knew that they were requesting to either verify that drifting was allowed or an alteration, but we just needed to do step one first is to say, what was approved and what do you have going on there? I agree, the previous decisions never limited the number of events that they could hold. However, there were conditions saying occasional use for motorcycle racing would be allowed um, in place of karting events. So therefore there is a natural need to know how many events are you doing, do you have for karting and how, you know, you need to show how you've reduced your karting to accommodate your motorcycles, which is why we were asking for frequency and information on that. So we can make sure that if they're swapping events out, then of course we need to have some type of measurement to make sure that, you know, like if they're going to say, we're going to swap out, um, 
carding event for drifting events, well, we need to know how many carding events there are to make sure that you are in compliance with that proposal. I just wanted to talk about traffic. Um, staff doesn't think that just saying we hope and expect to have no additional traffic impacts, that's not um, adequate um, demonstration of burden of proof. Uh, you know, it's like you need to demonstrate that you will not have additional traffic impacts. The data they provided, I realize you don't have exact headcounts, but the data that was provided showed that anywhere from 500 people to 2,500 people will be in attendance or participating in these events anywhere from one to 14 times. And that is definitely an increase from what they've historically showed us of participation for the carding event. So um, I do not believe that the applicant met the burden of proof that um, as of how they have actually traditionally been using the site for drifting, um, that has not increased in traffic impacts. And um, that seemed to be have been reiterated from some testimony that we heard today. Um, I have a lot of notes here, sorry. So, um, um, so you know, if you look through the staff decision, there may be, I may have like misstated that motorcycle use was never approved. But if you read through, I was very clear that motorcycle use was approved. And, um, but what I'm, I didn't go back and read, but what I might've been trying to say is that expansion of the dirt track was, was not approved. I have the 2006 decision open right here um, with regards to um, the motor, which is where motorcycle racing was approved. And it says motorcycle racing shall be limited to the existing paved track and an extension of the track. And it says see following condition and shall occur on weekends only. And then, um, so then condition five in 2006 six says, the car and motorcycle uses are limited to the existing paved track and an extension of the track at the northwesterly corner of the track area as demarked upon an aerial photo in the county file. And so the aerial photo that I provided in my um, uh, PowerPoint today was from this land use application. I can provide a copy of this um, if the record is left open. So, okay. and then I also provided the aerial photo, which one year after, which showed where the dirt track was. Um, so staff believes that only that small portion was allowed and all of those extensions were never approved. I understand that the applicant said that the decision didn't say it was okay to change and move the track, but they also didn't request that. So. And that area photo was from the 2006. So the site plan, so the grainy site plan was from the decision in 2006, and then the aerial photo was from 2007. Okay, area photo 2007. Yeah. And grainy site plan is about right. <laughs> yeah. It's a little bit more clear uh, and like I could share my screen and pull it up right now if you want it as well. But yeah, what's, that about? what's that? Uh no, actually I saw it. I did. Okay. Okay. Um, and then just some concerns with the noise study. I want to just reiterate, like um, it looks like they were running, they verified that they were running uh motorcycles on the paved track as well as the dirt track at the same time. But per this 2006 approval, that large extension was never approved. So, and they were only allowed to use that little extension off of the paved and they were supposed to mostly be on the paved per this, the 2006 extension. So staff strongly believes that you need to omit the noise study from the paved track and then running them together obviously is going to increase that noise to bring it closer up to um, the noise of the drifting events. Um, if you look at just the noise of the, I think there was one for a motorcycle on the road, it definitely is lower than the um, noises of the drifting. And I just also heard that the noises for the drifting uh, the at an actual event, and it sounded like they only had six cars on site. And per their, in their data that they submitted, they show anywhere from five to 2,000 attendees coming, and they said they run one car, and then they get one going, and they get one going. So if they only have 
six cars on site and 2,000 people in cars ready to go and revving, it seems like those noise le levels might be a little bit higher. And again, I just want to reiterate that the decision said that motorcycles were supposed to be occasional and in replace of some of the karting events. And so karting events are the main focus of the prior conditional use, a prior non-conforming use approval and not having noise to compare drifting to the primary use of the site is concerning as well. I'm going to go through my notes. I think I'm done. Okay, just a minute. I'm making my notes. Um... Okay, yes, I'm done. Mr. Smith. Okay, thank you, um, Officer Cox. So just to be clear, that was staff providing rebuttal. Yes, argument. sir. Okay, again, okay, not taking a position. Mr. Um, Edgar would like to um, say a few things and I'll close. Okay. Um, let me... Mr. Edgar. Okay, you there? Yeah. All right, Mr. Cox, just to uh, rebut what Ms. Nesbitt said, um, the 06 07 approval approved the extension of the track. It was very cut and dry. What we've done is extend the track, the dirt track. There were no parameters, I mean, other than generalizations and a circle over a highly shaded area provided. But we, at the end, have done nothing more than extend the track. With regards to the traffic impact and them wanting to study, the reality of it is we started drifting in 2009 in the fall. Since between 2009, November, and the spring of, I believe, 21, we ran an event every single month with the exception of two times that we got flooded out. So there's been a huge uh, number of, it, of these events that we are now asking for permission to run that have been put on over well over 100 probably closer to 200. And we have not, the adverse traffic impact was never seen. You know, Mr. Colvin testified that, well, there's cars up and down the road and we've had to sit there and it takes five minutes to get out. That's a very, very, very busy road. And there's times coming out at three o'clock in the afternoon when we just have a normal cart practice day going on and it takes two or three, four or five minutes to get out. So, I mean, I, I can't say that he never had to sit there and wait, but we sit there and wait all the time. Mr. Colvin is also one of the owners of a uh, sand and gravel pit that is adjacent to his property that attracts a lot of dump truck traffic. And in the winter time, makes a complete mess out of that road going both directions. So I find it ironic that he is going to complain about impact on the road, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah. The point I'm trying to make is we have held these events probably 200 in the past 10 or 11, 12 years, and there's never been uh, an impact with the traffic. When she quotes the numbers 500 to 1,000, that is not 500 to 2,000 cars. That is the number of people that come in and out and come on site during the day. Um, typically, we don't have more than 120, maybe 130 participant cars that come in in a day. Um, and because these events are an exhibition that, you know, the track's usually hot for six hours, we get a lot of people that come in and stay for two hours and leave. People show up when we open. They show up middle of the day. They show up at the end of the day. Let me it, clarify. It gets... I, on When you say then 120 to 130 cars per day, you mean uh, at any given time? No, we will have because 120 said... to 140, you know, typical 
drift event is somewhere in that 80 to 100 participant cars, drift cars. Again, mm -hmm. only six or eight are on track at a time. Um, the bigger events that we've had, we've had up to 200 cars, but you still only have six or eight running on track at a time. And she quoted numbers 500 to 2,000, which we've never had 2,000 drift cars on site. That's, we've never had 500. We've only had okay. 200 once or twice. I, I must not be understanding. That's why I'm asking again. But so I, you said 2,000, you know, sort of participants, people on, on site. And if you only have 10, 200 cars, then that's 10 people per car. And um, that's my problem with it. I, I just don't understand where that, how you're projecting that. I, it, I just want to understand. So there's, there's a difference between the number of drift cars and sure. people on site. We yeah. have, you know, the guys that drift, they pay a fee, they get licensed, they go through safety checks before their cars go on track. We okay. get a lot of spectators right. throughout the day. A typical drift event that's not one of our multi-day deals is, I'm going to say, 80 to 100 participants, sometimes 120, and we'll have maybe three to 800 spectators also come and go throughout the day. So uh, you're you're not telling me you're not telling me cars thousand drift cars there. Yeah, okay. Not not the case, but nonetheless, we've put on over two hundred of these events, and we've never had an issue with the traffic to where the police have gotten. You know, I mean, we it's it's never been an issue for us. So for them to request that we do a study, we've kind of done a study from two thousand nine. 2021 and it wasn't a problem so that's why we contest that you know it doesn't create you know it, it doesn't overburden the traffic system on that road our road is i believe one of the three busiest non-state highways in the state there are tens of thousands of vehicles that travel that every day and it's a, you know, it's a major thoroughfare. It's the lifeblood between I-5 and Canby. And so for us to add a few hundred cars, you know, I don't know what the traffic count is, but for us to add a couple of hundred cars spaced out over a six or eight hour period is a complete non-factor in congestion that might be, you know, might be created by these events. And then the last thing that Ms. Nesbitt, she said that, well, we, we made a comparison between drifting and motorcycles and motorcycles is not our primary use. We made a comparison between approved versus unapproved. Motorcycles are approved. We can run motorcycles. We've never been limited to the number of motorcycle events. So, and again, I explained why we made the comparison because why we didn't have carts, motorcycles, all of the things that are approved on the day of the, the sound test because I couldn't have gotten two or three guys in their carts to show up. It's a small community and that entire community was out at McMinnville. And when we scheduled this thing and we got approval and we started setting it up, I wasn't aware of that. And we had every intention of having go-karts there, you know, all of the approved uses there so we could get a, you know, a complete sample of what we're allowed and approved to do. But it just, because of the date that was chosen, we couldn't do anything with the motorcycles. Thank you, sir. Thank you for clarifying. So that's just a clarification. And now, Mr. Smith. I'm going to put myself on mute. Thank you. And I'll just close here um, on a couple of things. Um, you heard um, the opponent that called in um, had also I guess, called in to Ms. Nesbitt in between. So I'd like to ask and make sure that this, you know, this application is decided based on, you know, the law and the, the facts presented um, by people that, you know, expressed firsthand knowledge 
of it and not um, just conjecture or opinion like the experts. Course, as I stated at the outset, I've not received any experts. They contact everything that I've considered was submitted at this hearing and is in the record that uh, I will likely also review the video of this, but of course that is not ex parte contact. Right, right. So, you know, there was one witness that was opposed and a staff. This is a, a type two hearing, uh, which is, um, you know, is, is has has certain procedures attached to it, which is ministerial, right? There's limited discretion here. So we're applying the law. And again, the, the standard was a greater impact than the current use, right? So we have the only person with firsthand knowledge that has experience out there that spoke opposed to this, saying that the day of the test, there was not very much noise. He also said that they did motorcycles later and it was the same amount of noise. That was, that was his testimony. So for the, for the witness that was opposed to this to admit on the record that it was not very much noise with the six cars and the motorcycles, um, you know, on the day of the test, is is the evidence. Now, Miss Nesbitt tried to put in opinion to the opposite, but she doesn't have firsthand knowledge. She wasn't out there. This, her testimony is not substantial evidence. Uh, with respect to the traffic congestion, even Mr. Coleman said that there's lots and lots of traffic on that road all of the time. But he didn't he didn't put on any evidence that there's an increase. Because of the of from what's a greater impact, an increase of some sort from this proposal. Again, we're asking to swap one vehicle that's already allowed to be on that on that track, which would be a cart or a motorcycle, for a car, and then re reduce the amount that would be there on that track at any given time from 50 if it was motorcycles or 40 if it was carts down to eight or maybe as little as six at a given time. So that's what the actual proposal is here. That's why it doesn't have you know, any change in traffic impact. The traffic that is authorized to be there already under the law will either reduce or be the same because the amount of users on the track is gonna reduce or be the same. So that's what we're arguing and that's the evidence that's been presented. So uh, with uh, Clackamas ZDL 1206 in mind, we believe that the approval criteria that have been cited has been met. And the key one is that there's no greater impact than is currently approved. And even if there is, Clackamas County Zoning Ordinance then says with the, with the um, addition of conditions, right? So even if it's a close call, Oregon law says if you can impose conditions to make it allowable, there's a, a, a favoring towards the use, the productive use of land. So we could impose conditions. Even if it's a close call, you impose a few conditions and the use can be approved because again, the impact that's take, been taking place there, sound study traffic is already approved by the prior permit. So as long as it's either by itself, doesn't make a greater impact or as conditioned, doesn't make a greater impact, the application can and should be approved. Thank you, sir. Does any party or member of the audience want an opportunity to provide additional evidence, arguments, or testimony? Does the applicant, and if not, does the applicant wish to waive the period for a final written arguments? Or if, either way, I suppose. If you want to take a minute to confer, go ahead. No, we're fine with closing the record, Your Honor. And uh, Ms. Nesbitt is the county. Okay, so I, I have received uh, the evidence submitted, the testimony and advocacy submitted. I will, uh, I'm going to take this and review it all and make a written decision in this matter. Uh, you should expect it within the next couple weeks. Okay, any questions about that? Thank you for your time. Thank you all, and thank you for your participation. It was a nice to meet everyone, and I will do uh, my best on this. Thank you. Thank you.